Um, of course, there's going to be no, if they're going to do an anarchist solution, there's going to be no single leader. Because mm-hmm. that would violate the principles of anarchism. So let's say that, well, let, let's go to natural law. Let's appeal to natural law to start working on a, a legal system. And there's a disagreement on which laws are natural law and which laws are convention. Mm-hmm. Um, would somebody have, if somebody were to say, well, you know, Danilo, I think, you know, law A is a part of natural law. He said, no, 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 it's not a part of natural law. But, but he thinks it is. Um, and maybe it really is. And you just are mistaken. Well, let's, let's give that example first. It, it really is a part of natural law, and you're just mistaken in thinking it's not. Would, he be, would it be illegitimate for him to impose that law on you? Well, what, what are you talking about? Like, what exactly, what is this example of, of the law that they're talking about? Well, I mean, for instance, natural law would have something to say about adultery. Let's say somebody thought it was a part of natural law that adultery was bad. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, well, no, it's not a part of natural law. It could go either way. Just whatever society believes is conventional. Mm-hmm. Now, the person who believes that it is a part of natural law, if you were to impose that law and enforce that law on someone else who did not believe that, that would be illegitimate. Would you consider it illegitimate? The way I would, I would, um, <laughs> you would deal with that particular situation, um, I mean, it's, it's more like, hmm, like when I talk about natural law, I'm like mm-hmm. I'm like I, these are the these are my principles, right? These mm-hmm. are the principles that I live by. Now, mm-hmm. if I see uh, an outright aggression, like like basically, if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody getting robbed, mm-hmm. I can choose to not get involved, right? That that wouldn't make me, uh, yeah. you know, that wouldn't be criminal for me not to intervene, but it would be yeah. kind of idiot like you you would be you'd be you know a, a bad <laughs> you'd be considered an immoral person yeah, if sure. you didn't intervene. So so basically. That's basically what I'm talking about. Like, so mm-hmm. so adultery. It's like, it's like, um, you know, the things that I consider, you know, under natural law are clear violations of self ownership, right? Clear violations of a person's consent. Okay. Um, right. So, mm-hmm. if if there's no for me, if there's no clear violation, mm-hmm. there, there's no necessity to get involved at all, right? So okay. so for me, I wouldn't impose my will. No, I wouldn't impose my will. On you know a situation that you know it may be considered immoral for some like adultery, but again, if there's no clear violation of self ownership mm. and consent, then the, uh, from my perspective, it doesn't warrant any intervention. Okay. Right? Now I, I think on a, on a business level, let's say two people create a joint company together. Like the most famous example of a joint company is Scrooge and Marley. <laughs> you know, from that? the Christmas Carol. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that's probably the most well known. Uh, of course, okay. Marley's dead by the time the Christmas Carol gets started. Okay. And you know, let's say they they incorporate two people, okay. and then of course the one person essentially appropriates funds without consulting the other in, mm-hmm. in the contract before you appropriated funds for whatever for business use you had to consult the other. Mm-hmm. Now, that would be grounds for that would be theft, because if you sign a contract to incorporate with someone. Mm-hmm. And when you dispose of the funds of the corporate of the corp- corporation, you have to consult each other, and you don't. Mm-hmm. Then that would be considered theft, and illegally, uh, you could legally take action against that, right? W- would that be considered, you know, an aggression in, in libertarian law? Yeah, yeah, I think that yeah, theft. You know, if you you write a contract and you say you're going to do something, and you mm-hmm. and you um, you know, I guess renege on that contract, and you you violate the terms. Um, then yeah, you, I think it would be justifiable to take that to, you know, I don't think I don't think uh, it would be advisable to go to a state court. I, I would take it yeah. to some kind of third party arbitration agency uh, to sure. deal out the uh, you know the appropriate um, um, you know um, restitution for that. How do you how do you yeah. make the victim whole again? That's that's always well. A- let, me, let me put it this way: Couldn't one argue that an adulterer is also in the same position when you make when you sign a marriage when you get her into a marriage? There are certain impl- implied obligations that both parties have, right. and adultery is clearly a violation of one of those um, obligations. And I feel like that that would be analogous to someone in a joint company right. appropriating funds without right. consulting the other person. Right. Um, yeah. And that would seem to me to be a very similar case that could be prosecuted under libertarian law, but most libertarians wouldn't seem to see it that way. Well, which is, well, well again, it's, it's up to the, the couple. 
like or, or let's say the, the the man is the man is adulterous it's up to the woman what she wants to do right because if they did sign a contract yeah you're right they would um she, she would um have recourse maybe to go to a third party arbitration to figure out what to do about it um but i think i think the i think also to take into account it's important to consider severity like if somebody's getting assaulted sure. it's okay to restrain or to um you know defend yourself or fight back and prevent you know prevent the assaulter from doing any more damage to whatever means necessary up until killing the person right if you're yeah. being assaulted you don't know what their intentions are right you don't know if they want to kill you so you have every yeah. every um justified reason to defend yourself by whatever means necessary right theft i mean if they <laughs> they, they they take your wallet i mean you don't have to kill the person but i'm just saying you can use whatever force is necessary to get that wall your wallet back uh -huh. right so so basically what i'm saying is um, I don't see adultery as justification to kill somebody. Like, but you but would, in that, in that but way. you would see a theft of a wallet as potentially justifying kill somebody. Potentially, potentially what? Say it again. I mean, but you, but you would see as a recourse to prevent theft, taking uh -huh. a life could potentially be acceptable. Uh, I mean, it's not. It's not like as severe as let's say assault, rape. Sure. Or, you know, or attempted murder. It's, you know, of course, clearly, it's not that severe. Like, if somebody hacks into your account or something, steals some money, you know, you. Don't, yeah. I, I don't think you have the uh, justification to go over there and kill them. But mm -hmm. I think I think that there is justification to contact them and say, "What the hell? <laughs> Why'd you do that? Yeah. And, yeah. and let's yeah. go to yeah. court. Like, you just stole my money. So I think there's justification for that. But uh, but anything else, physical aggression. Um, uh, like we mentioned, assault, rape, and murder, or attempted murder, um, definitely justifies any kind of, uh, or actually even even threat threat of violence. Like if somebody has a, of violence, yeah, yeah. So somebody has a gun to your head, you don't have to wait for them to pull the trigger for you to do something about it, mm -hmm. you know, because that's a that's a threat of violence. Uh, so yeah, so well, yeah. okay, let me put it this way: I would say this that not all forms of non consensual authority are illegitimate. The classic example is a parent and the children. Children do not consent to the laws given by their parents, but no libertarian or anarchist thinks that's immoral or unjust. Mm -hmm. Well, very few do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to ask a two-year-old to consent to the laws given down by their parents. They may be good laws, they may be bad laws. Mm -hmm. But nobody says, well, give a justification for that. Mm -hmm. uh, another, example, another example would be, this is a, this is a bit different. But let's say we have somebody that is mentally or physically handicapped. Mentally handicapped is probably a better case. And they have a caretaker. Um, no one is going to say that. I mean, assuming the caretaker is exercising gross negligence, nobody is going to say, well, that's unjustified. Mm -hmm. Well, of course it's justified. Because the mentally, or even the physically, I mean, even a physically handicapped person is going to need a caretaker too. Mm -hmm. And he or she may not be able to consent completely to what's going on because they're physically incapacitated mm -hmm. so that's that's a non-voluntary arrangement right. especially in the case of a mentally impaired person but most people would consider that to be a more or less acceptable though rare mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. the parental situation is not rare at all it's quite common but mm -hmm. so those are two examples of non-consensual authority that are legitimate mm -hmm. and if there's at least one form of non-consensual authority that's if there's at least one form that is legitimate, mm -hmm. then it opens the possibility for more forms that mm -hmm. could be possibly legitimate. Now, now, as an example, if somebody's going to try to use a gun to rob me, yeah, that's an illegitimate form of non-consensual authority. We all agree on that. No, no right. questions about that. Right, right, right. So it's, it's, what I'm saying is non-consensual authority has two types of <clears throat> there's justified and non-justified. Right. And we have to figure out which forms are justified and which forms are not. And I would argue... I don't believe that the anarchists have made the case that in all cases, state authority is illegitimate, non-consensual authority. Sometimes it is, but I don't think it's necessarily true in all cases. And I don't think they've demonstrated that, at least not to my satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I would say when I'm saying that I don't come down as a statist or an anarchist because I think it's contextual. Sometimes it might be better to be an anarchist. Sometimes it might be better to have a state. I think it depends on the situation. Okay. Um, so, so I think um, another thing that we should establish for our debate, like when we start it, um, you know, before we, yeah. you know, when we, when we start the recording and then 
we're going to do the debate is uh, definitions, right? Just so we yes. get a clear understanding yes. of what we're talking about. So define, you know, capitalism, state. define anarchy, define state, define um, um, authority. <laughs> well, let me give so, you my definitions so, and see if you agree with them. All right. My definition of anarchy is pretty much in the encyclopedia dictionary definition. Anarchy is a society where voluntary consent is the the, the primary means of social cohesion. So if you go to an encyclopedia and read about anarchy, what is that? Well, all interactions are voluntary. That's what Proudhon would have said. That's what Tucker would have said. Wait, wait, wait. So wait, say it again. This is your definition of anarchy? Yeah. An anarchist society would be a society in which all transactions between people, all interactions are voluntary interactions. Uh, well, no, actually. I think, I think that, would be, that, that would be a definition for me for voluntarism. All oh, oh, how, how, would anarchy, how would anarchy so, be different? Then? So strictly speaking, anarchy simply means no rulers. An like like just cool. just break down the word anarchos, right? No rulers, mm. as 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 opposed to okay. monarchy, right? So anarchy, mm. no rulers. So that's it. You know, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't outline any economic system, any pol any um mm. any, any way that people choose okay. to live voluntarily. Just no rulers. That's about it. And uh, where you go from there. So, and, and also, I like to draw a clear distinction between uh, a ruler and a leader, right? Yeah. A ruler is somebody who rules um, from above and issues, issues mandates and edicts um, through threats of violence and is, mm -hmm. and is funded through theft, which is taxation, threat of violence, right? Whereas mm -hmm. a leader, and, and it's completely, um, you know, although we do vote, <laughs> we really have no choice in our rulers. I mean, maybe we have a slim percentage of choice of no, who the look, top look, guy is. Look, if Donald is. Trump were elected, the, the authorities would not be happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. But, but, but what, I'm saying is, what I'm saying is maybe we have a choice with the president, but every single person below that, you know, you got the chief justices, you got the, the, the Federal Reserve chairman, you got, all these people are appointed. So we have really no... Uh, no voice for these people whatsoever, right? So, so really, uh, they are rulers, right? They they rule from above and they issue mandates, mandates and edicts with uh, by, 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 by threat of violence. And you have to obey them, right? And we have and to obey the, them. I think that, that's the key thing, right? right? You have to obey them. And and then a leader would be somebody uh, that you voluntarily choose uh, to follow. Like, um, I don't mm -hmm. know, like, uh, you know, somebody that you idolize, you know, somebody, you know, books you read, yeah. you know, books you read by sure. somebody, you know, somebody, you, your YouTube channel you follow, you're like, oh, I like this guy. So that, that would be a leader, somebody that you like and you like their ideas and you choose to follow them. There's no threats of violence associated with that whatsoever, completely voluntary situation. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the first um, delineation I like to make. And then the other one is um, talking about the parent-child system uh, or the parent-child relationship. Um, yeah, that's not, that's not a consensual situation. You're right. You know, you, you know, like we, I had a choice to become a parent, right? Every yes, person who's a parent has a choice. The child has no choice, right? They had, they didn't choose huh? their parents. And so effectively, um, they're in a, um, in an involuntary situation, basically. They're basically, yeah. you can say, in a sense, you can say they're hostages. Um, and so therefore it's, it's, uh, it's, up to the parents to to make sure this is the way I look at peaceful parenting anyway to make sure that their that their uh, upbringing in their childhood is so comfortable magnificent and wonderful that given the choice mm -hmm. between all parents they would voluntarily choose you right you know you you say so, cuz mm -hmm. cuz they didn't choose to be there they're completely dependent on you for food shelter yeah. clothing Everything, right? Everything that completely mm -hmm. depended on you, and so you know, you you sure you can abuse them, you can treat them like crap. Like you could. I guess, I guess, uh, you know, without like if getting arrested or anything, you could theoretically do that. Uh, but then again, you know, your children are gonna hate you, and they're not gonna want to be around you, and they're gonna flee <laughs> the first moment they can. So it's not, um, it's highly immoral and unethical to do uh, to act like that, and and that's why I, that's one reason why. I, Peaceful parenting is a major, um, is a major thing I also talk about in my in my videos. Mm -hmm. So uh, now, okay, so I think we've defined anarchy. I, I mean, those are fine. I'll, I'll use those definitions for convenience sake. Um, now, capitalism. I, I don't know if this is your definition, but I would say that capitalism is the uh, private ownership of the means of production, right? I mean, people privately own property. That's what I see capitalism is. Yeah. If individuals are allowed to own private property and then through that generate revenue and income and productivity. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely um, absent state interference. Completely. Okay. So, so no, it, you, that's what, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so that would be a qualification that you would make. That's fine. Um, I think I think that would be a kind of capitalism. I would think capitalism is a bigger concept, and what you're at, arguing for is a kind of capitalism. But but that's fine. I mean, I'll, I can. Roll yeah, with yeah. That. What I basically, I mean, a simpler definition of capitalism that I give to people is just basically, uh, again. Um, basically, it's basically voluntary interaction between peaceful people. It's what it is. It's like I have money, and you have a product that I want, and so I buy mm -hmm. that. We trade. It's just it's just trade. It's like it, it, I mean, it can go. To, it can it can start all the way back from barter. That it, it could kind of be considered capitalism. We're just trading, and through the trade, I benefit and you benefit. Right? Completely voluntary. Mm -hmm. Nobody's forced or coerced. And if if it what if one party did not consent, the trade wouldn't occur. And if exactly. one, and one and if one party did not consent, then that can't be considered capitalism. That's coercion. That's violence. That's not that's not peaceful trade. That's more like theft or aggression or assault, right? Uh, so it, it's clearly uh -huh. in my mind, it's clearly defined as voluntary trade between peaceful individuals, where each individual profits. So it's a win-win situation. Would you argue? Okay. Yeah, that's that's I've heard that definition from um, Walter Block, and that's the common libertarian definition. Mm -hmm. um, now, as the state, would you uh, would you define the state as a monopoly on violence? That's a common one that you hear amongst libertarians. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I would expand that though. Maybe a monopoly on violence over um, a given geographical region, uh, mm -hmm. propped up by the belief in authority and funded by the theft of taxation. Basically, okay. <laughs> that would be my complete definition for that. Okay. Now. That yeah okay, but, but I I would I would the way I would define the state is slightly different because the way you're defining it again is heavily indebted to Weber. I mean, and, and as far as it goes, I think Weber has something good to say when he says who, the state is an apple on force. Who was that? Yeah, that was Weber who said that. That was back in like 1918 or something. Really, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's where the definition comes from: the state as a monopoly on force. But you see, I, I find that definition to be. I mean, it's adequate to a point. But I, I think that a better definition we get in Aristotle's politics. Aristotle defines the state as a – well, it's going to be a little bit of a complicated definition. Aristotle says that man is a social animal. He says that men cannot live in isolation. Otherwise, they'd be animals or gods. They must live in community. <laughs> and he says that the basis of community is the family. And he believes that the purpose of the family is to – one, produce children that can carry on you to the next generation and educate them in the ways that they should go. And now the state or the polis, the city-state, Aristotle would define as a collection of families coming together to create <clears throat> a society and institutions that would allow them to educate all of their children more effectively. And, you know, you could then, that group could then match up with another group of similar size and et cetera, et cetera. So he would define, the state itself is a kind of extended surrogate family where uh, a classic example of, of what, this would, what this is like is in the ancient world, you had what was called uh, patriarchy. The Romans had the patria familius where the eldest male living would be a sort of essentially the patriarch of that family would hold the purse. And so everybody down the line to like, you know, the grandkids, if they got, if he was that old, probably just the kids and maybe the grandkids, if they got married and had kids would all be operating under his general authority. And he would, he would be able to dispose of the collective income. I mean, presumably, and not necessarily on a whim, he'd have to consider the other concerns of the family as well, but he would have the sort of like final veto power. So let's say you had a family and I don't know, uh, the Rhone River Valley in France where you create wine, and they had a bad year. And he had another family in Sicily, which was producing a lot of grain, so he said, well, you know, you have a surplus. We'll send some of this money over to your family in France to keep them going. Now, Aristotle would say that's the basis for how the state forms. And we've seen plenty of examples in history. We can see in the Old Testament, Moses was a patriarch. We have with the Greeks, Solon and Lycurgus, who were patriarchs of their people that created Athens and Sparta. Uh, we have... Uh, other historical examples. So that is a form of state formation. Not the only one, mm -hmm. but it is a form. And I would argue that Aristotle's definition is more accurate to what the state really is. Now, there's a kind of contractual state, theoretically, the social contract, mm -hmm. which is 
the result of John Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau. I, I would agree with um, libertarians and anarchists that the social contract is, is a fiction. It doesn't really exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would agree with him on that point. But you see, all they've done is refuted one definition of the state, the one that we have in the modern age of the social contract. But they've left completely untouched more traditional understandings of the state, which we could think of like the Greek city-states. Or, you know, um, another example might be ancient Israel or feudal Europe. Mm-hmm. You know, these, these are not states in the Hobbesian, Lockean sense at all. But they are centralized authorities, so they, they, would, be, they would be a kind of state. Mm-hmm. So I would say that, yes, modern-day states are, are more like the social contract justifications for a state. Mm-hmm. And so they're more contractual in nature, theoretically. And, but, uh, but I would prefer the older definition of a state because I think it's more accurate to what really goes on. Um, so I, I, when I say the state, I will be using Aristotle's definition uh, most of the time, unless I'm specifically talking about a modern state in which I'm probably talking about some sort of social contract state. Does that make sense? Yeah, and and what came to mind when you when you explained Aristotle, I think um, I think Plato also had a similar um, conception of the state, right? In, in his um, yeah, in his think, in his Republic, the Republic uh, book, uh, which I which I read like twice, I think <laughs> tw- two or three times, uh, way before I got into this stuff. Uh, but it's a brilliant, um, it's a brilliant work. It's, it's good, yeah, but uh, only. I, I mean, I really like, I really enjoyed it, but only later I, I really came to realize how it, it seems to promote like socialism type, you know, cent- centrally planned uh, regimes. <laughs> well, one of the things that you need to read as well is Plato wrote a book called The Laws, okay, and The Laws are another piece of political philosophy that Plato wrote that helps clarify what he actually believes would be a good state. Okay. Okay, so I, I, I've not read The Laws either, okay. and I have read The Republican. Yeah, it does seem to... It's a little creepy at times, but it <laughs> might not... But Plato might have changed his mind later on, because yeah. he does write a book called The Laws. Okay. Um, so I'm just letting you know what I mean by the state when yeah. I say state. But one of the things that I found that I have a problem with, libertar- voluntarists and anarchists, is I don't like the way they define the state. It's It's... Okay... The, uh, the Mises uh, human action glossary defines a monopoly as this. The price which emerges when a monopolist gains more from selling a smaller quantity of his monopolized good than he would from selling a larger quantity at a lower price. In the absence of monopoly, competitors... Oh, it's monopoly price. I'm sorry. I want to define a monopoly. Monopoly. The two, these terms have two distinctly different meanings. One, A, a state of affairs in which an individual or group of individuals has the exclusive control over one of the vital conditions of human survival. In this condition, the monopolist is the master and the rest are slaves. It is the pattern of all socialist states. And it's no reference to a market economy. And then two, state of affairs in which an individual or group of individuals has an exclusive control over the supply of a definite commodity or a factor of production. In this sense, every market participant is a monopolist if he's commodity or service he offers cannot be duplicated by a competitor such monopolies of no importance unless market conditions permit the monopolist to charge monopoly prices which they rarely do without government intervention now those are the two definitions now the problem is private property is a monopoly on violence that's the definition so a private property holder has the same definition as a state a monopoly on the use of violence over a particular territory. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's the same thing. I need a, more pres- I need a better definition here. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that it's, they haven't really defined their terms yet because they, they just defined it the same way they defined a state. A violent monopoly over a, ser- a space of land. And to me, that's, well, that's the state. That's what you just said the state was. This is what private property is. So is every private property holder. Uh, it's also a monopoly, too. So every private property holder is a monopolist and a status by that definition. <laughs> yeah, Which, I, I've heard of that. I've heard of that, uh, that argument that, uh, yeah, that, that private property is a form of uh, violence. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not or, saying or, it's a form or, of violence. Or, or, or I'm just monopoly. saying it's monopoly on violence. But, well, well, yeah, <laughs> monopoly on violence. It, but, but it is. But, I okay. mean – you, yeah. if you, if somebody were to move, if someone were to move onto your territory, I've, I've heard Walter Block say this numerous right. times. Right. Now he, he does believe in scaling violence. You don't, 
if you have a trespass, you don't whip out a bazooka. No, you, <laughs> right. you, 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 no of course not. Right, right, right. But what I mean is, <laughs> if the if the if Walter Block will say this though, that yeah. if the trespasser refuses after every nonviolent effort right. to leave, right. you have recourse to some violent activity to remove him, and he doesn't because it's not his property. Well, that's a monopoly on violence, and I feel like well, we need a better definition before we go on. Yeah, and, and that's probably uh, yeah probably another thing we should define is uh, private property, <laughs> um, which uh, which and, and and how is private property acquired, um, and yeah. uh, and the way I look at it, um, private property is either um, you, know, <clears throat> you can acquire it one of two ways through homesteading or appropriation, <laughs> or through uh, inheritance or gift, right? Uh, yeah. so somebody can give you their property. Um, so, so you, you know, and if, and if, uh, yeah, if, if, or, or what's it called? The first use principle, I think it's called where if, yeah. if, if a piece of land is unowned, you can theoretically claim it as your own, as long okay. as you, uh, homestead it, which means you change the surrounding area to de delineate mm -hmm. where you live. And, and not only that, but I think, uh, it's also important to understand that you, like, you can't go to the moon and then say the moon is mine. Like I own the moon mm -hmm. because theoretically you can't defend <laughs> The entire moon. So the way I look at it also is, uh, is um, you, your property is your own up until how much you can defend it, right? So therefore, you can't you can't own the entire United States if you're the first mm. one here because you can't defend it. <laughs> so, but you, well, but you so could you defend change. it if you hired people as uh, mercenaries or private security. You could do that. Well, yeah. So let's yeah, say, I guess let's in, say in that, that let's say could. that you homesteaded Texas. Hypothetically, you were the first mm. person to take Texas. Okay. That's too big for you to defend by yourself. Okay. Well, okay, first of all, people that say that don't know people from Texas. They have pickup trucks. They have huge frames of like 10. <laughs> wait, hold on. Hold on. Wait. Are you talking about before Texas has been populated or now that, now that it is populated? Well, the, the, the argument in an abstract sense is one individual isn't going to be able to defend that much property. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is that people of the Texan mindset can defend a lot of property with their family, but okay. but even they could defend even more if they hired private security contractors. Right. So, this is where you and the you and the anarcho communists would disagree. Mm -hmm. You both agree. You both seem to agree that you can keep what you can defend, but you would say, "But what I can defend can be increased in size by hiring contractors." Uh, they would not accept that, but. And I mean, as far as it goes, I don't, I'm not against contractors. So, yes, you could defend actually quite a lot of land with contractors if they voluntarily agreed to work for the wages you set them. Yeah, yeah. So, if I, I mean, if you're talking about an unpopulated Texas where there's nobody there and you just stumble yeah. upon it and you're like, this is mine. And, and somehow, you know, you build some kind of fence and you outline your private property and you, you, know, you, you alter the surroundings and then you hire, you know, I guess uh, your private security and you and you have them patrol your private property, I have no problem. You hire Blackwater. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, private security. You, you know, you, I have no problem with that. You know, if you can take care of it and you can defend it, I have no problem yeah. with that. I, I completely, I really mm -hmm. uh, support the idea of privatization of everything, basically. If, if, there, sure. if there was privatization of everything, of, uh, of you know, even of, like, uh, Walt, Walter Block wrote a great, a book which I have not read. I want to read it on the privatization of the oceans, um, mm -hmm. you know, which uh, which I think is a great idea. You know, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and of course applies to the land as well. Privatization of the land, do away with all um, yeah. publicly owned property, which which in my view is is I look at it as um, you know Gustav Molinari said that yep. uh, you know all pro all, all uh, public property is uh, is stolen and all or, or yeah all public property is um, is uh, oh no public property. Is a is an oxymoron. Private property is is a redundancy <laughs> because all mm. property is private. If it's not private, it's stolen, right? So, well, then so what do you think way, about what do you think about the commons? Then you know, like in the commons, like in yeah. medieval Europe, you had commons. Would that be legitimate or illegitimate then? Because it's not private property. Well, if 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 we're not talking about a state, right? Like you can have yeah. you can have a society. The way I look at it, people okay. again, people voluntarily yeah. choosing to live together, and they say this is the commons. Sure, I see no problem with that. But once you have, once you have a centrally planned monopoly of violence state that says we own the the entire you know West Coast, mm -hmm. and and you know they don't they don't improve it, they don't make any any appreciable changes to it, they don't 
they don't um, yeah. produce goods of value that people that people buy and and cherish, you know. And basically, I mean, most of the time, what they use this this enormous <laughs> public property for is like uh, grounds for you know nuclear detonations, <laughs> things like that, <laughs> yeah, which yeah. Uh, arguably makes it worse. Um, you know, I I just. Um, yeah, it doesn't it, it doesn't improve anything. And basically, you know, I, you know, the tragedy. Of, I don't know if you if you if you were referring yeah. to the tragedy of the commons, but uh, but I also uh, you know use that argument as well as as being against you know why public property basically fails um, is because when mm. there is common ownership of anything, <laughs> meaning the state. I mean, not not like a commune. Okay. Like, like okay. With, a, with a centrally planned state. Mm. Um, there is, uh, there is, I mean, I mean, even, I guess even without a state, if, if, I mean, th that's why I'm like a capitalist, right? Like I, I'm a voluntarist yeah. in the sense that you can live wherever you want, but I'm just going to say it's likely to fail, but it's not immoral for you to live there. Yeah. That's, all, try that's, to all, do that. that's yeah. all I'm saying. So, well, you know, so, yeah. the definite, here's the problem that I get. Okay. I, I, the, 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 the hypothetical, let's go back to the moon. Nobody's living on the moon right now. Let's say you went to the moon. <laughs> And you said it was yours, and right. then you hired contractors to defend it. <laughs> that you actually could defend it. It would be yours. Okay. And you said, well, I don't see that different than a state making a claim to territory and defending it with troops. It seems to me very, very similar. Um, not really. I, not really, because the, the, the fundamental incentives are different for private ownership than they are for a state, right? Because private, o private ownership... Is like if if I own something, it doesn't matter how big it is. If I acquired it either through purchase mm -hmm. or through inheritance or just through homesteading and appropriation, um, then I have a, a vested interest to take care of that. Like I don't want to own crap, <laughs> right? Like yeah. if I own something and it just it just disintegrates and I just destroy the the, the area, that's not really going to benefit me. So it's really to my best interest to keep it functioning well and keep it prosperous. And so that's yeah. why the, the way I look at it, privatization uh, really um, ensures prosperity, right? Because everybody has a vested interest oh. to take care of their private property. But see, here's the interesting thing. According to Hans Hoppe and Democracy the God that Failed, monarchies are private states because they are privately run by one guy. <laughs> so they would, on the one hand, like say the French Empire. Yeah. You consider that a state. Right. But it's also privately owned and privately run. By the French king, so, and well, and that's one of the arguments he makes in Democracy: The God That Failed. So there would be a positive incentive for the French Empire to be run well because it's privately owned by the king. Well, I, I agree with you there that uh, you know having something um, run by, let's say, you know the 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 federal government, which has like you know a new president every four or eight years, and then you know Congress, you know members coming in and out, and so there's nobody really that has a vested interest to keep things um valuable Going. for long term right so their mm -hmm. their their mm. basic their basic incentives are like you know spend like crazy print like crazy run up the debt <laughs> because because <laughs> it, it, because all all they care about is for everything not to collapse and uh you know and uh you know unfold un under their watch right they they want they yeah. want to kick the problem down to the next guy right and and you're right like in a monarch uh, 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 a monarchy, monarchy um the incentive is to take care of it. You're right because he, it's his empire or it's his it's yeah. his country, and uh, and likely he'll pass it down to his own child who who probably he doesn't want to pass down crap. <laughs> or or, <an> enormous, <laughs> I know you or you wouldn't right? Or, I mean, if you right. wouldn't, why or, would or an enormous would? debt or you know um, you know you you, you want to you want to pass down something that's lasting to your children, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you're right compared to. Uh, you know, uh, a representative democracy, a monarchy has better incentives towards private property, but of course it's not <laughs> completely private. No. Uh, but, but yeah, but it has more incentives yeah. towards private property. So yeah. Well, what, do you, right. what do you think I about agree. the donut problem where you homestead a piece of land and everything around you has been homesteaded by somebody else? And then that person doesn't like you and won't let you leave your land or feed you or anything or let anybody cross his land to get to you. Mm. Have you heard of the donut problem? Yeah, yeah, I have heard of that. Like, uh, so how would you deal with that then, as a, as a voluntarist? Because he well, would be within his rights. Yeah. The guy that owns the ring around you, maybe right. he didn't like you, <laughs> and he won't let you leave. He will. He won't let anybody come to you to feed you. Right, right, right. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, he, could, he could literally starve you to death. I have heard totally, of that. Yeah. Totally legitimately, but that just sounds wrong. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, and, 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 but, it, but according to libertarianism, there's nothing really wrong with that. Because right, it's right. totally voluntary, and, and they were legitimately homesteaded. 
Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing, like, I've heard people say with roads, right? If, if roads are privately owned, what's to stop somebody from, from making roads in a circle around your house and then, and then saying you can't come on my road, right? Um, but, uh, I mean, I mean, there's all these little hypothetical situations that we can ponder and speculate. Uh, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that you can, you can really, like, like, I've heard another one, like, you know, non-aggression principle, right? Don't initiate force against people if you don't want, you know, force initiated against you, right? You, only defensive force is justifiable. Um, so, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, okay. I'm listening. Okay, and um, and then and Larkin Rose made made one argument, which is like, if you could, if you had to, if if you knew the world could only be saved. If you had to slap one person, would you slap one person <laughs> and violate their... <laughs> like, like these are like um, you know yeah. really really uh, uh, extraneous and uh, and you know and um, you know you know really abstract uh, hypotheticals um, and it's true. I mean, you could really theoretically figure out like these ideas, um, you know, a way to make this one exception. But um, you know, I think that I, I think well, for me, what's yeah. most important. Is right right now, you know, we can ponder this stuff, and it's fun to ponder. But again, I think it's it's more important for us to think in terms of, let's say, of today and now, and what's actually happening with the mm-hmm. state, and and maybe maybe you know, looking at the way things are now, what do you think is necessary for our state to con- to continue to exist, right? Because because mm-hmm. because you don't call yourself you know an outright anarchist, right? So what portions of the state today do you think is necessary to um, to maintain yeah. its, uh, you well, know, its existence. Yeah. I mean, I would say that what would be legitimate activity for a state would be, of course, the big three. Private, uh, security internally through the police force, security externally through a military, and then the judiciary. I wouldn't necessarily limit it to that. I mean, there could be other things. Again, it's contextual. Sometimes it's a good idea, sometimes it's not. I, I mean, for instance... If you were living in ancient China or ancient Babylon, there was not the capital to build the irrigation networks of Mesopotamia. Mm-hmm. Only, only the king of Babylon could do that. Nobody had that kind of capital. Mm-hmm. And, th- and those irrigation networks fed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Mm-hmm. And they survived until they were destroyed by the Mongols in the 13th century. Mm-hmm. Now, at that time, may- maybe later on, people could have developed capital techniques that could have allowed private individuals to build these irrigation systems. But at that point in time, no one could do it. And I think that was uh, a a very positive step for the development of Babylonia. Mm -hmm. China had the same thing. Egypt had the same thing. And also India. They had these rivers that needed to be irrigated. And really the only people that had the capital to do it were um, the states. Another modern example would be Singapore. When Lee Kuan Yew developed Singapore, for instance, Singapore Airlines, he said, look, uh, there's not enough capital. The state's going to have to put up the front capital for Singapore Airlines. But then he said that he wasn't going to subsidize them. He was just going to put up the capital. And Singapore Airlines is one of the most successful airlines in the world. Mm -hmm. So I don't see why the state couldn't be another economic investing actor. I mean, I don't see why it would be any more or less stupid than you or I. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be stupid, it could be dumber, it could be smarter. It just depends on the person running the organs of power. And so what I'm saying is that, yeah, I mean, if if it hadn't been for the kings of Babylon, you're, you're very unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely to have had those systematic irrigation systems mm-hmm. that made life in that region of Iraq possible. Mm-hmm. Um, the same, the same, so that's an example of state planning that works. That's another thing. When, when libertarians like Rothbard said state planning doesn't work, it's demonstrably false. Mm-hmm. It does work sometimes, just like not all private ventures work. Mm-hmm. Some fail, some succeed. The state's the same way. Some fail, some succeed. Mm-hmm. I don't know the ratios between private and public investors. Mm-hmm. But again, it's not a uniform black and white, one size fits all answer. So what I would say in response to that is uh, basically the concept of, are you familiar with Frederick Bastiat? Yeah, the broken window fallacy. I think okay. is that where you're going? No, no, no. The seen and the unseen. Well, yeah, I'm familiar with that too. Okay. With so, the state invests, you don't know what private investor would have been able to invest instead. 
Right, right. So, so you know, we, you know, a lot of people make the make the claim like, you know, we have roads, right? We have all these buildings. We have, you know, these bridges, these <laughs> highways. We have, um, um, you know, whatever the state does um, that people consider good. We have USPS. We have, you know, yeah. education. Look at the, all these schools. You know, we have all this yeah. stuff, right? Um, and look at it. it had this one. Oh, libraries is another one. And how could you hate libraries, right? Exactly. <laughs> I get that yeah. all the time. Or or even state parks. Like if there weren't, if the government wasn't there, there would be apartments everywhere. There wouldn't be any trees. There wouldn't be any bushes. You know. Yeah. There, there, yeah. P- parks wouldn't exist. Do you hate parks? I'm like so. Um, <laughs> so so the so so the idea is is that yeah that the you know what the state has funded what the state has created with those stolen funds um is seen right but what we don't see is all the possibilities that have been destroyed have been annihilated because of the violence through taxation right through the uh mm. through through the threat of uh threat of uh punishment that people were forced yeah. to pay against their will um to fund those projects, right? And and so we see those projects as like you see, like I say, I guess same thing with the pyramids, right? We see all these wonderful, magnificent structures. How can you be against that? And and it's not like I'm not against bridges, I'm not against highways, I'm not against yeah, buildings, yeah. you know, um, or I'm not against pyramids, I'm not against uh, you know what, what you said, canals uh, or irrigation dishes. What sure. I am against. And again, back to the moral argument, I'm against coercion yeah. and theft, right? So I oppose the state mm-hmm. on a on a moral ground primarily, right? So and yeah. so yeah. you know, you, I mean, you can I guess I can I could also make the utilitarian argument that that I think in that in that era of I think you said ancient Babylonia, um, mm-hmm. that um, that I think that if the state were not there, if people did not you know, um, have this belief in authority, this belief in statism, and and believe them legitimate, and pay them those taxes. I think that, and and the people were free to you know engage in economic exchange. Um, I think that they would have probably had irrigation ditches way before the state made them, uh, because I I really don't think that that calling you know get, getting together a group of people and giving to giving them this um this authority this monopoly on violence to to rob you know the productive individuals mm-hmm. i don't necessarily believe that that makes them smarter and actually um because of the, yeah. uh, actually because of that monopoly on violence to me that completely distorts and perverts those incentives so that so that okay. the d- decisions that they do make are are mm-hmm. necessarily on the whole much worse off than than would be made by yeah. by free individuals investing their their own capital in what they deem to be important. So, okay. um, so now yeah. what I what I would say you're not going to like it. But yeah. What I would say is well, that it's historically, I, I, I have nine percent left. So if I die, yeah. that's, fine. that's fine. What I'm saying is historically, yeah, there is no example of any non-state society in the ancient world. If you give it ten thousand years, even. Mm-hmm. Nobody was developing irrigation canals except the centralized. Have you heard of uh, Vitvotel, the uh, Marxist? Uh, he was initially a Marxist, then he became an anti-Marxist during the Cold War, and he was a sociologist. He talked about the hydraulic empires, no, the no. China, India, no, no. Babylon, and Egypt. Okay. Absent heard. those hydraulic empires, irrigation canals were not being built mm-hmm. by anybody. Mm-hmm. They just weren't being built. Mm-hmm. Now. You know, could they have been built in some other? Let me let me rephrase this. I've heard libertarians say, if you say it wouldn't, you can't know that it wouldn't have been built without the state. They're perfectly right, but they also don't know that the market would have done it either. It's yeah. a possibility the market would yeah. have done it. You're right. Yeah, the market. My, and my so what I'm saying, I'm saying is, both assumptions are not. You really can't prove them. Yeah, Either way, there's right. no way to know. Right. That's, that's a counterfactual. Right. But what I am saying is that I, I don't really see how uh, you couldn't look at an emperor or a, a president mm-hmm. uh, or whatever as another investor on the market mm-hmm. uh, who's able to make rational or irrational choices like anybody else. Mm-hmm. I feel like that, well, he, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I mean, mm-hmm. certainly... Um, you know, if I were to compare a failed business venture with, say, the Manhattan Project, mm-hmm. the state looks pretty good. But if I were to compare, say, you know, Google with Soviet collective farming, the state looks really bad. 
So, <laughs> I, I mean, like I said, it, it's not cut and dry. It's really, it's really kind of fluid. Sometimes the state makes good calls. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes private individuals make good calls. Sometimes they don't. Mm. That's why I really don't want to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm only this or only that. I mean, I have my own preferences, mm -hmm. but that's different from, right. like, you, you have your preferences for a, a capitalist society, but right. in a voluntary society, you could have communists if they were voluntary. Sure. Yeah. And I'm saying the same thing. I mean, I, I have my preferences, but I wouldn't consider that to be prima facie illegitimate. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing was, uh, this, this is maybe more just something to think about. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you call... I actually remember in that debate, you called taxation theft, mm -hmm. uh, you called conscription kidnapping, mm -hmm. and that, that's quite common for uh, libertarians to say that. Mm -hmm. But you see, the fundamental moral argument that I have against voluntarists is that they do not practice the non-aggression axiom. They, they don't because abortion is unlimited aggression against another human being. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be a very immoral position. Mm -hmm. And I actually find it to violate the non-aggression axiom. <laughs> but libertarianism would allow you to do that. Now, you may not like it, but within a voluntary society, that would be considered one among many lifestyle choices. But uh, really, I mean, you can just kill a human being for... You could say, well, it, it, uh, common arguments are, well, the fetus isn't conscious, it's not viable... Well, I can tell you what, a, a brain-dead quadriplegic is not conscious or viable. Can we kill him, too? <laughs> I mean, he can't, he can't feed himself, and he's brain-dead. Well, right. a brain-dead person or a quadriplegic aren't viable. <laughs> and so I guess they can get killed, too, right, according to the logic of abortion. Right. So, no, then you could say, well, they're not human yet. Well, it, well okay, well, if, if they're not human because they're not conscious, someone in a coma someone sleeping and someone who's brain dead isn't conscious either. Can I kill them too? I mean, it's a completely ridiculous argument. Right. And I find that to be that it allows as it stands now yeah. for a, for lack of a better word, murder mm. in the same way that you would consider taxation, theft and mm. conscription kidnapping. We can, we can hash out whether all these things are really what we call them, mm -hmm. but I would consider it murder. And mm. most libertarians are totally okay with that. I, there are some that aren't. There are pro-life libertarians. Mm -hmm. um, I find Hans... Walter Block's evictionism is really kind of fraudulent. Mm -hmm. If you listen to his... Art, his he, has a, he has a series of podcasts called um, Radical Austro-Libertarianism. Mm -hmm. It's actually pretty interesting. I listened to most of it a few years back. He had one on abortion. He said, well, evictionism says that the, the fetus is a trespasser and you should use the minimum amount of force necessary to, <laughs> to get rid of it. Okay. And he says, with future, with future scientific technology, we'll likely be able to save first, second, and third trimester fetuses. Mm -hmm. The fact is, if you can't do it, like say 100 years ago, you couldn't even save a third trimester fetus, mm -hmm. then you could kill it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's still abortion. You mm -hmm. haven't really found a compromise at all. It's predicated on the assumption of potential scientific de uh, development. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, you're never going to make a zygote viable <laughs> outside of a woman. It's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, no, no, it's abortion light. Okay. It says abortion's okay sometime, but not all the time. Yeah. And, it's, and it's completely arbitrary. It's based on our level of technical development, right. which is totally arbitrary. Yeah. And I'm like, well, wait, this is terrible. <laughs> and then not only that, well, Tom... Uh, Another level of murder was uh, in the New Liberty. Rothbard said you could let your child die of starvation. <laughs> right. I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. That's and, and then even worse, even worse, <laughs> Walter Block said in his lecture on Austro-Libertarianism, if you have an unwanted child and no one is willing to adopt it, you could expose it to die like the ancient Greeks and Romans. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, wait, whoa. This is worse than Rothbard. I mean... <laughs> You're actually going to just kill it, not even just let it start. You could actually aggress against it. <laughs> right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Walter, don't have kids, please. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, I'm like, no, this, th th that's for me the main moral argument that I have against voluntarism. Because um, it really is involuntary in some cases. Well, I, well, I don't, I don't think that Walter Block has described himself ever as a volunteerist. I don't think. I think he's, he describes himself more as a, an Austrian economist or, or a libertarian, yeah. right? But, but Rothbard 
I think is more universally recognized as a sort of authority on this. Okay. Yeah. And certainly abortion itself. Right. Most voluntarists, libertarians, anarchists, most mm -hmm. would say that it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. And the other problem is it's totally arbitrary. What if you have a third trimester fetus 10 minutes, 10 seconds before it exits the womb? <laughs> Can you kill it? According to voluntarism, yes. <clears throat> ten minute, ten seconds out of the womb, can you kill it? Well, according to Walter Block, you can, but generally, no. <laughs> and what if it's a partial birth where its head sticking out? <laughs> well, it's it's arbitrary. I mean, where do you? Right. What it's just it's just mad. And they say, well, well, the fetus isn't viable. I guarantee you, a two year old is not viable. If you leave a two year old alone and don't feed it, clothe it, and change its diapers, it's gonna die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, well, I'm all, I'm, all, I'm about to die. <laughs> I have three percent left. Yeah, I'll let you go. We can but, pick this but, up um, Tuesday night. But, uh, but yeah, abortion. Um, I don't know if you listen to my other videos, but abortion is is not really something I touch on at all. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. I just have no interest in talking about it. To me, it doesn't seem like it's an important issue to talk about, or that mm -hmm. important of an issue to talk about. Um, as much as like you know, warfare, taxation. Um, you know, but public let's education, face it, though, all that kind more of stuff. people have died from abortion than warfare. According to the United uh, Nations, since abortion was made legal in Western countries. Really? Uh, okay. So, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I uh, over that. a billion people have died really? since 1920. Okay. <clears throat> According to UN statistics, every year 40 million children are aborted, mostly in China, but also in Russia and Western Europe and the United States. Okay. So more people have died through abortion than all of the wars and all of the diseases put together. In all of human history. Hmm. Okay. One billion people have been killed in the past 90 years. Right. There's, there's no, nothing even, the Black Death, the Mongol Hordes, World War II are just peanuts compared to that. Right, I right. mean, 